we're trying to get it cool, but um, however hot you are, just know that I'm that much hot. <laughs> so um, I know there was a problem at church, so we have an early arriving crowd, so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, and I, this week we're studying uh, John 7. Uh-oh, I've got the wrong one up. This is that, it's that kind of day. Hold on one second. All right. Maybe now we can get started. So it is the right one. I just didn't change the text. Um, we are studying John 7, verses 1 through 15, and 37 through 39 today. It's all about the Feast of Tabernacles. So let's bow our heads as we start. Lord in heaven, we just thank you for your blessings to us. We thank you for the end of another week. We thank you for the Sabbath where we can, it, we're so thankful that you put it in place where we can just step aside, let everything else go by. We ask now that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we study, and we thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So just to give you a little context about what we are going to be studying today, Jesus is in Galilee, and there is a six to seven month gap between the John chapter 6 and John chapter 7. So how do we know that? In, in John 6, 4, it talks about the time of the Passover, which is in the springtime, and that's either in March or April. By the time we get to chapter 7, it's the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us what Jesus is doing during those six months gap between John 6 and 7, but there's nothing from John. John begins chapter 7 with, after these things. It's the same way he wrote in Revelation, after these things. John is telling his own story. The whole book of John covers only 21 days of Jesus' life. And he spends three and a half chapters on the Feast of Tabernacles. So John must have thought it was very important to look at this Feast of Tabernacles very closely. At the start of chapter 7, when John says, after these things, what things is he talking about? After what things? Well, we've actually been studying about them the last few weeks. He just makes a convenient skip of those six months. Um, some of the things were he went to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, to the plain of Gennesaret, and he healed many people. He had a confrontation with the leadership over hand washing. Then he went to Tyre and Sidon, and he healed the possessed daughter. Then he fed 4,000. Then he went to Caesarea Philippi, and ask his disciples, who do you think I am? He also announced to them that he was going to be crucified and die on a cross. He was transfigured, and he healed the epileptic son. All in that six months between John 6 and John 7. But the biggest thing that he was doing during this six-month period was teaching the disciples and getting them ready for the time after his crucifixion and life without him. We can see it in retrospect as we look back at his life, and I think it would be very interesting to talk to the disciples because they could certainly see it in retrospect after the cross. He was spending that time teaching them. It's interesting that all these things happened in that short six-month period, and John didn't even mention them. It is because it did not serve John's purpose of writing the book of John. 
As we've discussed earlier, all four Gospels had a different purpose. And John's purpose was not to give a chronology of Jesus' life, but to give you the identity of Jesus. Jesus is God in a human body. John felt it wasn't important to give all the details, but he wanted to paint that picture of God in a human body. These verses in chapter 7 begin a whole new section of Jesus' ministry. From this point on, there is an intensity of hatred toward him that will take him straight to the cross. In six months, he will be dead. John records that the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Next in the spring will be the Feast of Passover. This will be the last time Jesus is in Jerusalem before that, piece of, uh, before that Passover feast and before he's arrested and put on a cross. In John chapter 11, it says, from that day forward, from chapter 7 forward, they plotted to kill him. And that's what we're studying now. The feast takes place in the fall, after the harvest. It's a festival of great joy and celebration. It's one of three pilgrim feasts that happen each year. You know the others? Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Those were the three pilgrim feasts. According to Josephus, the Jewish historian, the Feast of Tabernacles was the most important, significant, and joyful of all the feasts. All males were required to come. Thousands of people were in Jerusalem, and the city went from about 100,000 people to over a million. It was an eight-day event that began and ended with a Sabbath. I thought that was pretty cool. It began and ended with a Sabbath. Many important events in, history, in Israel's history took place at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was when Solomon's temple was dedicated. You can see that in Kings 8 2. It was when the Israelites who had returned to rebuild the temple gathered to celebrate under the leadership of Joshua. The Jews heard Ezra read the word of God to them during the Feast of Tabernacles, and his preaching resulted in a great revival that happened, and we've studied that earlier. It takes place on the 15th of the month to Shir of the Hebrew month to Shiri. It was the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, and it occurred in our September or October. The feast always began five days after the Day of Atonement and at the completion of the harvest. It was a time of celebration as the Israelites celebrated God's provision for them in the harvest and during the 40 years in the wilderness. I found this interesting tidbit of information in my study, and I'm just going to throw it out. There's, there, there's no proof of it either way. I just thought it was interesting. There are many scholars who believe that it was likely that Jesus was born around the Feast of Tabernacles. They suggest it would be unlikely for shepherds to be in the field with their sheep in winter, but it would have been likely they were in the fields tending their sheep at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. They also look to the words, these scholars do, of, of John in John 1.14, where he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word John chose to speak of Jesus dwelling among us was tabernacle, which simply means to dwell in a tent. The Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated because God dictated it both in Exodus and Leviticus. In Exodus, he says, And you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, of the first fruits of wheat and harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at year's end. In gathering at year's end. 
I'm going to get camp meeting in here in a minute, too. <laughs> There'll be in gathering and camp meeting in the first 10 minutes. So, hey. He also dictated it in, set, in Leviticus 23, 32, and 33. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So the people built booths that looks a little something like this. Um, commemorating their wilderness wanderings in the desert. And since it's a Jewish feast, you can imagine there's rules around everything, right? So the, the law required that the booths be built so that the thatches were wide enough to see the stars at night to show how God provided for them. They were camping out under the stars, and when wandering in the wilderness, God provided for them. They celebrated the harvest and God's wilderness leading. So since they were celebrating his wilderness leading, what were some of the things in the wilderness that showed the children of Israel and later generations his leading? What were some of the things that happened in the wilderness that showed his leading? Anybody? Yes, right here. Manna. Manna. That showed his leading, right? What's anybody something else? Water from the rock. Water from the rock. Not only water from the rock, and we're going to look at that because that was a very big part of the Feast of Tabernacles, but water from a rock for a million people. A million people. Yes. There was the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Pillar of fire by day, pillar of cloud at night. Your Anything else? Around. Who their, said that? Their sandals didn't. Their shoes out. and their clothes never wore out for 40 years. Amazing stuff. Anybody else? I think that pretty much got all mine. But he, he showed the leading and he didn't want them to forget it. <laughs> um, does that festival remind you of anything? It's time for the camp meeting thing. <laughs> <laughs> Reminded me of camp meeting. When I was young, we used to pack everything we owned and go down to Bass Memorial Academy. And you think it's hot in here today? <laughs> we lived in tents in the middle of those pine trees for a week. And it was hot. And it was hot. It reminded me of the festival. Yes, right over here. They used to do this at College Day when I first came down here in 57. They were pitching tents. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, thank you. Well, we had a station wagon, and that station wagon was packed as hard as it could be packed. And then we lived in those canvas tents, and I think Jay helped set them up. But they were they were hot. Um, so it, for me, the feast of, of booze kind of reminded me of camp meeting, and I think they did it everywhere. And then it went to just staying in a hotel and then it's just the weekend and just a, n a number of things like that. What if we made a celebration of God's leading in our lives? Would it make a difference? Would it make a difference in how we felt? I mean, I, God set it aside for them to do that, but I can just imagine, you know, we're going to spend eight days and we're going to think about how God has led us in the past. And if he led us this way in the past, he's going to lead us this way in the future. He didn't bring us through 40 years in the wilderness. Would it make any difference and would it help us trust God more if we did a celebration like that? Yes. Yeah, somebody. Oh, you, he's coming to you. No, but I just had a question about your experience at Camp Navy when you were young. Um, <laughs> I was didn't raise that I've been to camp meeting on hot summers as doing camp pitch, so I remember that part. But I'm curious for those of you who did who grow up going to camp meeting, what was your favorite part of camp meeting? Or was there so was, I was it the sermons? So I was a young kid. Yeah. I can tell you for my family, the 
favorite part. They started sermons at 6.30 in the morning and went till 9, 10 o'clock at night with just breaks in between. And my parents and family loved that. I loved the sports. Sport? They, yeah, they had stuff for they had stuff for juniors and primaries and and I loved it because you and you met kids from all over and you, then you ended up going to Academy with them. Well, I'm just making one other comment. And this would have been in the eighties when I was involved in Camp Pitch up at Conduct uh, Ten conference and we had to set up the tents and do all that. But I think what I found and what I saw people doing was, yeah, they were they were there for the, the the sermons and stuff, but there seemed to be just a ton of family, friends, and fellowship. A lot of that. I and mean, isn't that isn't that really what God calls us to do? Yeah. I, I, you know, there's something about community, and I've told this story before, but. We, when COVID came, we quit having classes for like two months, and then we just said we have to meet. And we met in Joe Melhome's lawn. And I don't know how many were there that first time when we met there. There were no masks. People were hugging each other. They needed that. They needed it. And, and I think that's why God calls us together. He calls us in the community. And, and for me, those times were awesome. Um, and I'm sure the kids, that was a, uh, at the Festival of Booths, uh, Festival of Tabernacles, I'm sure they, they loved it. They lived in, that's how they lived for a week. And they probably thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Um, so I gave you a whole lot of context to get started. Yes, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm with you on the kids' side. Family, friends, fellowship, Redwood Area Camp Meeting in Northern California, Grand Village Camp Meeting in Michigan, absolute high points in my growing up career. No, me too. I mean, it was hot, and it was, I don't think there's a hotter place in the world than Bass Memorial Academy. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. Um, so we've given a whole lot of context to the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. Who has John 7, verses 1 through 5? Thank you. First, Bobby, I, I want to thank you for that summary. That was amazing. It really put a lot of stuff in place for me and about the water of uh, God providing it for us. Uh, just one quick insight. Ron and I went to Egypt last year, and it was the hottest place I've ever experienced in my life uh, in the, on this planet. And we were, we were literally, uh, one guy forgot his hat on a 10-minute walk. He thought, oh, I'll be okay. He was dying. He was suffering. I gave him my hat, and I made a hat out of a, something from my backpack. And he was just so grateful. He was so touched. And we realized that it was he was either you die or you live based on if you have water. And when you fly over the Nile, you can see. You can look down on it and see a little green strip and a little line down the middle. And everything else, as far as you can see, is just death. And, and that's what touched me about how God sustained them with that water specifically. So thank you. This is chapter 1, 1 through 5, uh, seven, chapter 7, John 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers, therefore, said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that it works. Its works are evil. So there's a whole lot of context here. Um,
First of all, just that little phrase, Jesus walked in Galilee. Can you just imagine? We're talking about heat and we're talking about water. Jesus walked in Galilee. Can you imagine? Where he came from, they flew or they appeared or they, and he could say, do this and it's done. Or he could, and he walked in Galilee. Dusty, hot, walked in Galilee. I can't even imagine. Um, I haven't, I, I don't know who has been there, um, and I haven't, but I've seen the weather. It gets to over 100 degrees regularly. Um, I pulled up the weather there this morning, and it's 95 degrees. It was hot, it was dusty, and it was dry. And Jesus walked in Galilee. What an amazing God right there. What an amazing God. So, he didn't walk in Judea. Why did he not walk in Judea? They were after him. He knew they were after him. What is the epicenter of Judea? Jerusalem. Jerusalem is right at the epicenter. And he did not walk there because he knew they were after him. Was he worried about them? I mean, really? Was he worried about them, what they were going to do to him? that time, he wasn't. And we're going to talk about God's timing in a minute, but um, why did the Jews want to kill Jesus so badly? Anybody? They wanted to kill him. And that's why he didn't walk there, because it was not his time. But why did they want so badly to kill him? Yes, right over here. What I guess he went against their teachings and authority. He, yeah. So if you look at John 5.18, you don't have to because I've got it up here. But it says, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, remember he healed people and did all that stuff, but also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. That's why they wanted to kill him. He said God was his father, and that made him equal with God. Isn't it interesting that the Pharisees and God, and for that matter, Jesus, all wanted the same thing? They all wanted him to die, but it was just for dramatically different reasons. But they wanted to kill him badly. So we're looking at his brothers, and we're going to look at, at, at what they were thinking. But how many brothers did Jesus have? Anybody know? He's four. He had four brothers. And something not very publicized, did you know he had sisters? He also had sisters. Um, if you look at Mark 6, 3, it says, Is this not the carpenter, son of Mary? and brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? Never really thought about Jesus having sisters, but he had a full family. But it was his brothers that were giving him trouble. Why did his brothers want him to go to Judea? Why did they want him to go there? I'm good. Joan just can't wait to talk. I, I can see it. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Well, I didn't see you, buddy. I'm sorry. I think deep and down inside, they kind of believed he was who he said he was. And if he could just get there with the big shots in Jerusalem, he could convince them, and maybe then he would establish his kingdom. And, and what did they think he was? What did his brothers think he was? I think in deep down they thought that he might be the son of God, but surely if he went there to the to the leaders, to the big time, to the big time, time, like there you go, country, right? That he could reveal himself right there in the in the big place. And was that was that actually pretty good advice? At the right time, in God's time. <laughs> What did they think he what did what did they think being the son of God meant? I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. 
No, I, I wasn't really, I was wanting to respond or say something about your previous question about why they wanted Jesus to die. Yes. But if you want to move on, that's fine. I mean, with the question about the brothers and all. Or, well, just quickly, there is nothing in Jesus' life new or unconnected to everything that's gone on before. Does that make sense? From the beginning, and even be from before the beginning. So this idea that they were wanting to kill Jesus was really nothing new. He says it, right? He says it in verse 1 through 5. They hate me. They do not hate you. They hate me. So here's a, here's a, a question that I think is relevant to the rest of, to this particular story, but to the rest of Jesus' life, especially as you pointed out very clearly and very well, that all of this is about a very short time period that John is focused on. And it has to do with his trick to Calvary and to some degree what courage he had to go and do that. But, but during the week I was thinking on another death that happened so long before and it does just in some respects doesn't make any sense and that is the death of Cain, excuse me, the death of Abel. I mean right out of the chute, I mean how much more quickly could somebody be killed and hated than that story in the Garden of Eden? No, excuse me, outside the Garden of Eden. I, I don't know that we know how quickly that took place. But I, I had the question, what in the world welled up inside of Cain so quickly after mom and dad after you know, that he was willing to murder his brother. Shows you how pervasive sin is, right? Well, sin is pervasive and it doesn't take long. And this is the this is another comment not that I've made, but that I've read that caused me to question what was going on then here in this particular story. And that is, is that another author has said Cain's murderous attitude toward Abel was not really directed at Abel. It was directed at God. Because God asked for a sacrifice and he said this is the best I have. God said this is not what I want. I'm, I, I ask you to do this. And his brother was accepted and he wasn't. I mean God does mean what he says. And That's right here. The hatred how much hatred does it take to kill or murder somebody? Because it was considered murder. It wasn't just a, a defensive act. Yes, right here. Well, God asked for a blood sacrifice. Cain thought, well, if I offer my best, that should be good enough. Our works will never save us. And he got angry at God, I believe, but he took it out on his brother. But evil, like you said, doesn't take long to just come to points of murder, okay? Jesus knew that they wanted to kill him. They killed prophets on the steps of the temple. They all along, they didn't want to hear what they didn't want to hear. If it, people, if the prophets were not going to say what they wanted to hear, they would kill them. And the truth of the matter is, I said that it was because he said that he was the son of God. But why? And I think that was part of it. But why else were the Pharisees so upset with Jesus? He was not part of the club, right? He was doing his thing, and he was not part of the club, and they had their ideas about Sabbath, and he healed people on the Sabbath. Really? He healed people. He did good on the Sabbath. He was making them look bad. Mm -hmm. And I think his brothers were in that position, too, a little bit. Hey, you're, you're making our family, you know, you're putting us in a precarious position. Let and us help you out. And so I put these questions up here. But what, what do you think the brothers were hoping would happen? They were hoping he would go to Jerusalem, take over, start the revolution, be king of this earth. That's what they hoped would happen. They just didn't see it. Um, so Jesus said to them, 
It's not my time. It's just not my time. Does this tell us anything about God's timing? Do we struggle with God's timing sometimes? Do we get ahead of God's timing? Um, his brothers believed that he was going to be a political messiah. So to go to Jerusalem and get the leader to get the leaders to sign off was good advice if he was a political figure. But they had a totally wrong view of what he was about. Um, I'm going to look a little bit more in a minute at God's time. But let's go to John 7, verses 6 through 10. John, while we're getting there, John, the book of John is broken up into, into three parts. Uh, verse 1 through 10 is before the feast. 10 through, I want to say, 22 is during the feast. And then to the end is after the feast. But it's all about the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, go ahead. Therefore Jesus told them, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival, I am not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. So it did this, uh, these texts brought a few questions to mind for me. Why did the world hate Jesus? And as I thought about it, does it continue today? Yes. Why does the world hate him? And does it continue today? It continues today. Why? Why does the world hate Jesus? The good Why makes people feel like uncomfortable. It makes them feel uncomfortable. Who else had something? Light. He's light. He's light, and light takes the darkness away. Um, why does it not hate his brothers? Same reasons, right? They don't hate them because they're his brothers are part of the, the world. And Jesus is just different from that and brings that light. Would we hate him today? Would we hate him today if he were here on this earth? And we have our whatever the views. We have our views on the Sabbath. That if he was out in the parking lot healing people. Would we hate that? Because it was outside of what we would we? Yes. Oh, good. Even today, we don't like people telling us when we're doing something wrong. No, even, even in our own relationships, in our own religion, we do something, somebody say, you really shouldn't do that. You don't like that. And all, all Christ was doing was trying to tell them that what they were doing was not good. And we don't like people telling us what to do when we know that they're doing it. And he had such a nice way of doing it, didn't he? I mean, when he's just writing in the dirt and all of her accusers leave, there's just story after story of that. He doesn't go up and say, you're doing wrong, and I'm going to tell you why you're doing it. He had a way, but he got his point across every single time. Um, what would it have been like to grow up with Jesus as a brother? What do you think about that? What would it have been like to grow up with Jesus as a brother? What would it be like to live with a perfect brother? Always makes his bed. <laughs> Yeah, it would be, it would be, I came close to having a perfect brother, and there were times. <laughs> What's that? It was tough. It was not easy. But I love him now, just so you know. I do love him. <laughs> but it had to be, it had to be difficult for them, this guy. And I think Jesus grew into knowing that he was the Son of God. I think that was a building process for him, but. If he was like Joseph and he was 12 years old going, 
You know, guys, I think I'm the son of God. Oh, really? Really? I'm the Messiah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna free people from their sins. Really? Um, could the enemies of Jesus have killed him if he had done as his brother said? If he had left and gone to Jerusalem, as they said, could his enemies have killed him? God allowed it. If God allowed it, yes. But it wasn't his time. It was in God's time and he moved. But he did go and he went secretly. Yes. Uh, I was still thinking on the the, the hatred, the, the uh, um, what would it have been like to have Jesus as a brother and so forth and so on. And it's was there something wrong with Jesus? You're asking me that? No. It, it's like, was there something wrong with Jesus that caused the brothers to not to react to him the way they did? Is there something wrong with God that we um, don't accept him? Don't like him, um, fear him in the, in the wrong way. Do we think there's something wrong with God? Well, that I causes think, people to be afraid of God because. So I think you bring up a good point. The majority of the world is afraid of God. And I think as as we look at his brothers, and you, you, you'll have right over there. If if you look at his brothers, yeah, go ahead. No, that's right. My point being is that the 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 problem is not with. The Godhead. The problem has always been with our understanding or our relationship to the Godhead, to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It still is. Well, that and, hasn't and that's the away. point I was going to make. If you look at his brothers, if you look at Jesus' brothers, they didn't believe him when he was growing up. But after he died, look what they became. His brothers bought in totally after his death and resurrection. And look at what they became. They became his biggest proponents. Um, so it was in them, to your point, it was in them, not in him. Yes? When you're, when you're in a new place and you're trying to make friends with people, you kind of gravitate toward the people who are just as weird and as quirky as you are. They've got the same, they've got similar flaws, they've got questionable flaws, but they're flawed people. And that's what attracts us to people. It's that they're just as flawed as we are. And the Bible says that God loved like a mirror. And if Jesus is the embodiment of the law, and you see your sin you you look at him it, it rubs you the wrong way and I think that's what that's what our issue is or that's what their issue was as well is that they didn't like the fact that he called out their sin most of the time really not even saying it directly and isn't that what's so amazing about righteousness by faith God looks at us through Jesus. He doesn't look at our sins. Yes, I'm sorry, right here. Right here. I think that we're a lot like they were then. So if, if we're open to the Holy Spirit, we would see that we need to change, that the Holy Spirit wants to change us, and we would be receptive to his message. And if we're too stuck in our own pride and our own, I want to do this, don't talk to me about that, I don't want to hear it, then we would reject him too. I think it's the same. But it's not necessarily that we would all reject him if he was here today. It's it's if you're open to his spirit or not, because his spirit is working on everyone. Everyone. And only those who say, no, no, stay away from me. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me. Uh -uh, no, no. 
it isn't that the Holy Spirit won't continue to work with you, but his voice gets softer. You know, he, the Lord will allow us to refuse it. But it is not that he doesn't work hard on our hearts and we're all the same. We're all the same as we were back then. And he came to his own and they rejected right. him. But there were people that totally accepted him, right? So I want to talk about God's timing. Don't you think God's timing is an important expression of his will? God's timing. Would we get better decisions in our lives if we waited for God's timing? How hard is that to do, though? How hard is it to wait for God's timing? And how do we keep from running ahead of it? We look at our lives and we want, I, I, I think we all see that God's timing is, is perfect. And yet we live down in this maze of decisions that we make. And, and it's hard to wait for his timing, isn't it? Uh, but I do believe it's an important expression of his will. Uh, um, six months later, Jesus comes for the Passover and he does not come secretly. This time, he presents himself as a king and allows the adoration on the same weekend that he died. Um, so the temple precincts for the Feast of Tabernacles were lighted up each night. They had these huge pots and they would put four pots on a pole in the temple area. The temple was 35 acres, the whole temple area. Um, they were lighted up each night, and there were many poles filled with oil and lit. According to Josephus, the historian, it was so bright that every courtyard of every house in the city of Jerusalem at night felt the glow. I mean, that picture was as close as I could find, but it, it was a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that because it, over a million people felt the glow of that light. In the stirring ceremony each morning, the feast, each morning of the feast, the shofar trumpets would blow. And the priest would walk down from the temple, as you know, it's a, 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 a high mountain, walk down from the temple, down the steep slope to the Gihon Spring, and he would take the gold pitcher, fill it with water, raise it up, walk back up the hill to the altar, pour water on the rocks as an emblem of the water coming out of the rock in the wilderness. This was all done to give everyone a visual of God's leading in the desert. It was also to look forward to God's deliverance going forward. During the ceremony, and I thought this was really interesting, during the ceremony, the people held citrus fruit in one hand and palm branches in the other. And the citrus fruit represented provisions and the palm branches represented deliverance to show God's provisions and his deliverance. And I just think about the Israelites and whether they caught the significance of that. And I started thinking about some of the things that we do as ceremonies. And do we really get the significance of them, or do they become just, for instance, communion? Communion, does that just become something we do because we grew up with it? it, it it's hard not to, to get the significance of those things when you do it on a regular basis, but you just wonder if they did. Yes? I think you're bringing up just an excellent, excellent point and question because uh, thinking about that whole experience, whether it's camp meeting or a special weekend or, or something. Um, and I think we're going to find out, in, in fact, Ellen White references this later on in, the, in that particular chapter about at the end of the week, after they've been there all week. We're going to get there. Yeah, we're exactly. definitely going to get there. But, but you're talking about it right now because of what's happening. You said, when we go to these 
these things? Do we have communion or are we just going through the motions of it? And my only comment would be that the Holy Spirit, <laughs> without the Holy Spirit, everything is just activity. And, and, and we need That's to right. answer that in each of our lives individually. Yes. Are we going through the motions because they're motions? God put that in place. I mean, he said in the Last Supper, speaking specifically, if you do this in remembrance of me, do it in remembrance of me. We are told to do it, just like they were told to do the Feast of, of Tabernacles. <clears throat> do it in remembrance of me. It's the, lowest, it's the lowest attendance of the year. Come in here. Those, those attendants. So why do why is it? Is it because it makes church longer, or we feel uncomfortable, just as the people felt uncomfortable around Jesus? Maybe we ought to do like they did with the Feast of Tabernacles and require all the males to come. <laughs> <laughs> From all around. Yeah, and, and going back to the Old Testament, and again, that image that you have there, somewhat the image of the presence, the presence of God. Some. Some denominations have created the presence of God by putting in the sanctuary the presence that has been created by the mass. The whole point is, is that we want to have the presence. So what do we do to try and manufacture the presence? That the presence is important. And the problem is, this is my last comment, we can't do it. We cannot manufacture the presence of this of God. We can do it individually and in our hearts. You cannot manufacture it. The presence is, is the presence. We cannot create God. No, no, I agree with that. Um, so, we are going to, yes, I'm sorry. Um, regarding this symbolism and what these things represent, I think that in many ways we can look back at this and it seems very complex but very very simple at the same time and i think that we live in such a, a loud world now and everything that we're inundated with and we maybe have been known to to this idea that we can appreciate simple symbolism you know what parts of our communion actually represent and and really sit in those moments and and have that emotional connection to why they were set up and why they're still important to us today. I agree. So we're going to go to 7 verses 11 through 15. And we're going to move pretty quickly from here on because we have got to get to 37 through 39. So just two observations before I read this. First, in Matthew 12, 34, Jesus called the leaders brood of vipers. Vipers. You couldn't get lower than that. And the second thing is, look, look at that picture. It, it's glorious. But the ark was not there. It was an empty room. No mercy seat. All that had been given. Okay, so let me read this. Now at, the, now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed. They were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? So I just want to concentrate on that. There's so much we could concentrate on here also. I just want to concentrate, since our time is short, I want to concentrate on one thing. The three things, well, the two things they said Jesus was, 
What were the two things? He is good and he deceives. If you look at verse 20, it says he has a demon in him. So he's good, he deceives, he has a demon. What do you think about these options? I would just like to spend a couple of minutes on these options. What do you think about these options? None were correct to begin with. None of them were correct. But um, to say he was a good man, he could never be just a good man. There are things that he said about himself in John just up until chapter 7, and I wrote them all down. He said that he would raise himself from the dead, that he came from heaven, that if you believe on him, you will have eternal life, that he gives living water, and that he's the Messiah. He said that he perfectly obeyed God, and that he would judge the whole world. He said everybody should honor him just as they honor God. They should honor Jesus just as they honor God. He raised the dead before chapter 7. He said the scriptures speak of him and point toward him. And he said that believing on him was the most important thing a person could do to please God. Either he was right about those claims or he was wrong. If he was right, then he's God. If he was wrong, he's a deceiver. So he could not have just been a good man. He was either right or wrong about all those claims that he made up until John 7. Either a liar or a lunatic or God. And John's whole premise of the book of John is to say he is God. He is God. I got something from C.S. Lewis just thought of it. He wrote it in his book, Mere Christianity. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman and something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him, call him a demon, you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us, and he did not intend to. Any comments on that? That's just about as powerful as you can get. And Jesus said it going up to John 7. He said, I'm God. And John pointed it out every step of the way. Yes. Hold One on. of the ways we Hold on, hold on. We have a lot of people that want to hear everything you say. One of the ways we're told to judge people is by their fruits. Yes. We judge people by their fruits. And his fruits were exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. Everything that he said, he backed up. So word gets out quickly that Jesus is in the temple teaching and a crowd gathers. Just picture this vast piece of real estate, 35 acres, known as the temple courts. Right in the middle is the actual temple. But there are vast courtyards around the temple built out of limestone and marble. And there's thousands of people gathering there, getting ready for sacrifices, working with the money changers, talking with their friends that they haven't seen in a long time. There are two porticos. One was the royal porch. The other was Solomon's porch. They were shaded, and that is where many of the teachers would gather. It was here that Jesus found his audience. Can you imagine the crowd he's drawing and the people leaning in so that they can hear everything that he's saying. A lot of things come to mind. You know, what is he talking about? What's the reaction of the people who hear him? Uh, it, it's, it says it in the verse um, that they said, this guy didn't go to any of our schools. This guy didn't go to seminary. And yet, he's just amazing. 
There were 27 yeshivas or teachers in Jerusalem, and Jesus didn't study under any of them. But yet what he said was just amazing. And he was drawing people like crazy. Put yourself in the Pharisee's place. What are you thinking and doing right now? This was the turning point in hatred for Jesus. And it led him straight to the cross six months later. So we're going to go a little bit farther to John 7, verses 37 to 39. Jonah's got that. And we'll finish with this. It's actually just pretty amazing. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and he said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So this is the last day of the Festival of Tabernacles. And what day is it? Sabbath. It's Sabbath. Starts and ends on the Sabbath. This is the grand finale. Each day at dawn, the priest would blow the shofar trumpets, and trumpets from the hills would answer them. Then the priest would go down the steep hill to the Kedron, take a golden pitcher, dip it, get the water, lift it up. While the trumpets are still blasting, a million people are lining the sides of the road, and he's coming up the hill, the steps of the temple. And the people are chanting Isaiah 12, 2. With Isaiah 12, 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Can you just hear it over and over? With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy. They're chanting that. He took the water from the pitcher and poured it at the base to represent water from the rock in the wilderness. On this last day, before they poured the water, the priest would walk around the altar six times and then a seventh time. Why did they do that? Jericho was the end of their wilderness journey. And they did it to represent what happened at Jericho. Then the priest came up to pour the water on the altar. As you can imagine, there's a hush in the crowd when this is happening. And that is the moment that Jesus cried out. And just read it one more time, what he said. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. He didn't just say it like Jonah's saying it. I'm sure he yelled it out. There's a million people. If anybody's thirsty, I have living water here. If anybody is thirsty, who is that invitation meant for? And tell me what Jesus was trying to convey. Somebody tell me what he was trying to convey. And was it just meant for them? Or was it meant for all of us? I'm the living water. Yeah, I'm the yeah. living water. He's saying, I'm the living water. Did he just mean it for them? And what's he conveying by saying, I'm the living water? You'll never thirst. You'll always have me. Take me in, you never thirst again. You take me in, it was meant for them, but it's for us. I mean, just standing up here teaching and talking about water, I'm getting thirsty, and Jesus is saying, I'm the living water. You'll never thirst again. I, I just think that moment with, with the crowd chanting and then the hush and Joni and then the moment. I believe that God created us with a need, a desire, a place in our heart for love and worship of him and I think until we recognize it and accept the gift 
of water that we will always thirst. And I think what he was trying to say then and what he tries to say to us still today is you will always be thirsty unless you accept my invitation. There will always be something there. You can search wherever you want for it. You can do whatever you want. I'm telling you, I'm the answer. It's a mark and then, and then one closing thought. You know, what you said, Joan, that's exactly true. In this world, where do we drink from? What cisterns do we drink from? from? The other thing is, I read that we become like the five people that we emulate the most. So who are we looking at to emulate? There's only one. You know, when I go to the jail, I'll tell these, there's only one man we can, one person we can trust. That's Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. And for these people, I think back to what Chip said right at the start of our class, that Nile River, everything is, is dirt except for that Nile River. That was life to them. Water was life to them. And Jesus saying, come to me, you'll never thirst again. And I just want to close with this. The cry of Christ to the thirsty soul is still going forward, and it appeals to us with even greater power than to those who heard it on the last day of the feast. The fountain is open for all. The weary and exalted ones are offered the refreshing water of eternal life. Jesus is still crying. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. Let's bow. Lord in heaven, thank you so much for uh, your love for us and care for us and for sending your Holy Spirit here today. Amen. Uh, we just thank you for the life you live, the death you, death you died, and the, uh, plan of salvation that you put in place for each of us. And may we just uh, take that living water and never thirst again. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you all. Sorry everybody was hot. You can go out and have some water. <laughs>